Welcome to the State of Developer Education, a podcast by Major League Hacking. We explore how technical leaders are creatively tackling the developer education gap to help prepare the next generation of technologists for the real world and build businesses that can adapt to any changes in the technology ecosystem. I'm your host, John Gottfried. Hi, everyone. I'm John, uh, your friendly host here at the State of Developer Education. I'm really excited to be back for this episode with Jennifer Petoff, who is the Director of Google Cloud Platform and Technical Infrastructure Education. How's it going, Jennifer? I'm doing great. Great to be here today, John. Awesome. Well, I am so excited to have you here. Uh, so I always like to start with my guests with origin stories. You know, where, where did you come from and how did you end up where you are? So I know that you began your career as a chemist. Why chemistry? Like, what what drew you down that path? That's a really a really good question, and I always like reflecting back back on that. And yeah, or origin stories are always fun to tell. I would say, uh, I, th I think for me, I really like the fact that chemistry it's it's something that not everyone likes and not everyone is good at. And um, you know, some people find like, oh, I would never study chemistry, but for me, that just motivated me more. Um, I like being good at something that not everyone else is good at. And um, I know I really enjoyed my various science classes in high school, and I had the opportunity to work in a research lab at the University of Rochester the summer after my freshman year of college. And I really believe like that opportunity to apply what I was learning in this practical sense and the encouragement that I received really early on um, that cemented my interest in pursuing a career in chemistry. Uh, it's 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 not super typical to have an internship after your freshman year. It's more like after your sophomore or junior year, but. I really appreciated that that opportunity and a professor professor eisenberg uh from u of r taking a chance on me uh and i also i the, the, the other thing that i recall is my, my high school chemistry teacher actually laughed at me when i said i thought i might pursue a degree in chemistry um you don't have the patience to do research was her was her thing and um my re my immediate reaction to that was i'll, I'll show her uh and you know so again i i think i i, I tend to um you know, react in a way that I'm like, I, this is, this is something I want to do and nothing's going to stand in my way. <laughs> yeah. D did you always like both the, um, applied parts of chemistry as well as more of like the mathematical parts? Cause I remember back when I was taking chemistry class and I loved the labs and I kind of hated the paperwork personally. I, I, I did like both. Um, yeah, I, th I think, uh, laboratory research is more interesting probably than the experiments you do in high school or in your your college um, chemis chemistry lab for class. Uh, but I, I, do, I do I do like the hands-on pieces, although you really do need that grounding in the theory in order to be effective in the lab. So, you know, it may not be quite as much fun to sit through a lecture, but it's still really important. And I do think the quality of the instruction is super key. I, I was lucky very early on to have some really Good professors, so they they kept they kept it interesting. <laughs> yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, so you you went down that path. You know, you had that early internship that was really impactful, uh, and and you know you worked in hard sciences, right, in chemistry for quite a long time before going into tech. Um, why did that pivot happen, right? Like, what what drove you into a different industry? Now that's a, that's also a really good question because yeah I, I invested a lot of time you know getting the undergraduate degree pursuing a PhD um, and and like you said I worked in uh, chemistry research for a number of years and and the range of experiences uh, in in industry it, it was basically everything from you know very exciting things that would start on fire or explode if you expose them to air um, to things that were extremely boring so literally my job for a while was to make paint and watch paint dry so. <laughs> Um, so you could, you could see the extremes there, but it was it was always very interesting research nonetheless. But, I, I, but reflecting back, I think this pivot from chemistry was really 100% in service to what I call my guiding star. And, and what I mean by this is, um, you know, a personal guiding star to me is what motivates you, what gets you excited. And, and my guiding star is to travel as much as possible and live in different cool places. You can probably tell from my accent that I'm from the US originally, but I lived in Ireland for 12 years, and I'm currently uh, based in Lisbon, Portugal. So that's you know, that's where I wanted my guiding star to take me. 
And it turns out that chemistry research is not super great for achieving that goal. So chem chem uh, chemistry labs, manufacturing plants tend not to be in the most interesting of places. So, so over the years, uh, various opportunities came up. I had the opportunity to volunteer for campus recruiting. And I thought, ooh, yeah, I get to travel back to my alma mater to give tech talks and convince students to come work at my company. You know, sign me up. Ooh, I can go to other schools too, you know, ones I've never been to before. Like, yes, please, I'm, I'm all about that. And then I started doing more and more work with universities in, in service of this guiding star. And that was all on a volunteer basis. But then I was able to parlay that volunteer experience into a full-time role in university relations. And yeah, I actually anticipated doing that for a couple of years and then maybe going back to research or doing something else. But then <laughs> unexpectedly, Google reached out to me on LinkedIn about a university programs role. And my first thought was, you know, what does Google want with a chemist? This is really weird. But I, and, and I could have easily said, no, I'm not interested. There's like, why is there a fit? But but I was I was frankly curious. And I had a conversation with the recruiter. Next thing you know, I'm talking to the hiring manager. Then you know, I'm flying out to California, getting more and more excited with each passing day, uh, by the way. And uh, yeah, I managed to land an offer, which I was super excited about. And because I was willing to see and sort of walk through that door that appeared in a place I didn't expect, I, I was able to take my career in a new and exciting direction in tech. So all in service to that guiding star. That's awesome. Um, out of curiosity, do you consider yourself like a, a digital nomad? Not, uh, not really, because I, I think we, like my husband and I have a home here in Lisbon. So we have yeah. a home base, right? We don't own a home, but we have a, a, a home base. And um, I, I think of digital nomads as, as sort of moving from place to place, I suppose. Yeah. It'd be, I think it'd be interesting to try at some point, but I, th I think in my, I, I like to travel, but then I also like to come home. Right, yeah, so you wanna live in different places, but not necessarily every week. <laughs> it's, exactly, it's just it's just so disruptive. And I think it's, it's tiring to be on the road all the time, so. <laughs> I, I, I enjoy living in different places and, and you having opportunities to do short trips to different places, but always that uh, sense of coming home. I could spend the whole po podcast talking about travel, by the way. Like I'm also a part time <laughs> travel blogger, you know, like do all this stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, I digress. Let me let me get back to the, the main yeah. topic for you, John. No, totally. Yeah. Um, so you made that transition into Google almost like. I don't want to say like opportunistically, but you know, you you took advantage of something that came your way that was kind of different and unique. Mm -hmm. um, well, one of the things I was curious about is like, from a company culture standpoint, was there like a culture shock making that transition? Like, how different was going to a company like Google, which has a, a fairly like, you know, like well-regarded, famous like way of thinking about their company culture compared to what I would imagine is a much more old fashioned industry of, you know, chemistry and, and uh, labs. No, exactly. So th there was some culture shock originally, just I think um, the chemical industry tends to move pretty slowly and methodically. And Google, especially back in 2006, 2007, I, I felt like we were off like a rocket ship, basically. So everything was moving really fast. You know, we're launching, we're iterating, you know, we're going 100 miles an hour in this direction. Oh, wait, we're pivoting. So, so it, it, it just getting used to the pace um, took some time. But, but I found in the end that the, the, the way of doing things at Google actually suits my personality uh, better. I, I love the fact that you can come up with a hypothesis you know, run an experiment, like te you know, test, launch, iterate, and, and and really get that tight feedback loop going rather than, you know, sort of marching step by step um, slowly in some, you know, some direction. So it was a cool, cool, cool transition, but it did take some time. Yeah. So, you know, given that fast pace, right, and, and what you were being asked to do, which was, you know, a lot of as far as I understand it, things that Google had never done before. What went into building those programs for the first time, right? You mentioned a lot of iteration, but like, what did those initial steps look like? Yeah, I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit in the context of uh, site reliability engineering education, which uh, that, I, like, I've been at Google for 16 years, but I spent eight of those years in, in SRE. And that's, um, I think, what I'm probably most well known for. Uh, but I think, yeah, definitely, 
yeah, built uh, the ESSERY education program from scratch. Um, and I think I think the key thing that the, the key thing that it takes to build a new program at a company like Google is this number one, you need a strong grounding in the art of stakeholder management and stakeholder mapping, kind of understanding who are the decision make makers, where does the power lie, like who are your supporters, who needs more convincing. Yeah, I think it takes patience, it takes perseverance, um, and it takes an ability to really listen to feedback and show that you're willing to address that feedback or use data to refute. You know why that feedback wasn't necessarily a great idea in the first place, or the, the great idea that someone thinks it is. And I also think that experiments are key. So my background as a scientist really has served me well over the years. Um, you know, how can we get agreement on time-bound experiments or pilots? Like it's easier to get buy-in for something smaller and more self-contained. Um, if you have a hypothesis to test, you pre-agree those success criteria with the stakeholders, and then and then off you go. I know, for example, when we first started our SRE EDU orientation program, we had these sort of hubs that we were setting up around the world. And there was a question, you know, should, should, should the Europe, European hub be in Dublin or in Zurich? And, and um, the data would suggest Dublin was the good option for many reasons, but there were some, there's a very strong like Zurich, in, Zurich contingent. So, so we, we ended up convincing those stakeholders, okay, well, let's, let's try the Dublin experiment for six months. Let's look at the data, and then you know if there if your concerns are unfounded, we you know continue as is, and if your concerns are founded, we you know, we revisit it at that point. So it's it's just being willing to you know hear people and then see you know see if you can come up with a uh, reasonable compromise or a time bound experiment, basically. <laughs> That's super interesting. So I, I haven't really heard program development described that way before. Um, and it's very reflective of what I've heard more in like a lean startup-y, almost like product development process where you want to prove out your hypotheses with real people and see what happens. Yeah, that's, I mean, I think that's fair. I think, and, and, and I don't know if the, the approach to programs like this, if that's just me putting my experience in personality stamp on it or you know if like if it's if it's a product of the organization that I'm in it's you know it's, it's hard to say I think it's a confluence of factors that come into play but I've, I've found this to be a useful approach especially when you're start you're starting something brand brand new yeah yeah no I I mean it sounds like it works really well like I've seen a lot of programs perhaps fail because they were overly designed or, or designed in a way that didn't take into effect all of those micro factors that go into success, right? Um, so, I mean, it, it's a good approach, I, I imagine. Um, so as you were building out some of these programs, uh, you know, you mentioned that you had been at Google for quite a while before you started doing the SRE programs. Um, what were some of the surprises that came your way going into SRE? Um, what surprised me about going into SRE? That is a good. That is a good question. Um, yeah, because I, I, I think, like, I, yeah, I think I don't think I don't think there was anything that surprised me necessarily about SRE specifically. It was more like I think, and actually, John, just to pause for a minute, I think you were gonna like I, I'm sort of prepared to answer this question about sure. building new things in general. Um, I'm just Do you want me to rephrase it and then go the other direction? If, if you don't mind, because I don't really like, I'm just like, SRE is awesome. And like, <laughs> I, and that didn't necessarily surprise me. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, I, I just know, like, the reason I kind of asked that is like, I know SRE has like its own culture, right? That's like slightly different than software engineering. But yeah. 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 And um, because yeah, we could talk, we could talk about that a little bit as well. But like, it didn't, it's like, I guess because like I was working on the SRE book and things like yeah. that, like, it's that culture didn't surprise me either. So I, I guess it was less surprises there because I felt like I'd found my home in the organization mm. as opposed to, uh, you know, like, whoa, what am I getting myself into? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. Okay. Well, let's, let's go back. I might ask that in a different way, but, um, you know, as you were starting to build out these programs, uh, what what kind of surprised you about building things in a large organization, right? You described your process a little bit, but how, how did it feel? Like, how did people react? It was interesting. I was think, thinking a little bit about this question, and um, 
I actually think I was most surprised about the kinds of things you can actually do and the level of impact you can deliver with volunteers. So um, you know, I've worked in the SRE space for a long time now, and I'm, I'm you know, actually fond of saying, you know, knowledge about distributed systems is not surprisingly <laughs> distributed, as you might say. It's, you know, there's not everything in one person's head, nor could there could there be. Uh, and it, yeah, it would, it, and it would actually be impossible to staff a dedicated team to cover all the angles you may need to cover in a training program or in in in, in a writing project like the SRE book, for example. Um, so it just wouldn't be practical to staff a team of you know, dozens of full-time content creators or facilitators. And and one example I do like to point out, um, and we didn't really talk about this yet, but um, yeah, I'm one of the co-editors of the Site Reliability Engineering book that we published back in 2016. And that book represents contributions from more than 70 individuals representing over 500 years of Google production experience. It's all volunteer driven. So I, I, I found that if you have a small core team, and just like the enthusiasm of the volunteers, um, that that enthusiastic and dedicated volunteer group, and and if you know, they they give you anywhere between an hour a month to twenty percent of their time, like that's really where the magic happens. And I think like and you know, we talked a little bit about like what surprised me about SRE. I think just the enthusiasm and the engagement from across the organization and willingness to give time to projects like this and to and, and with SRE EDU to train up the next generation of, of SREs in the company as well. Do you think that that um, like willingness and excitement to volunteer for things outside of your core job responsibilities is like part of the like the 20% time ethos of Google or is it something else? I think it ties in. I think there's also an expectation at Google that you get, especially in engineering, that you're you're involved in community contributions. It's the it's the community contributions like this that really make things go, if you will, um, yeah. and and uh, it, you know, enables you to do so many so many things. You know, from training your your new your new your new hires to you know, like I said, writing writing books, very various other things. So it's 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 um. Yeah, it, it's it's baked into the DNA to 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 really participate in these community contributions. Yeah, I I, I really love that, and I, I think it's one of the things that always I don't know if it, it surprises me, but it sort of um, reassures me that technical folks like engineers are so willing to help out the next generation. Like there really is sort of a community support and a uh, training model that's built into the discipline as like a core principle of how people get up to speed. Yeah. And I think that's also amplified in the SRE space as well, uh, because I, I think SREs need to work across such a wide range of, of teams and you know, pieces of infrastructure, et cetera, uh, that it's, it, it's, even more, it's, it's even more amplified in that space as well. Yeah, I, I love that. So, to, to zoom out a little bit, um, you know, you worked on SRE for kind of, you know, half the time you've been at Google roughly and on other projects before that. And you came from chemistry, like you've touched so many different disciplines. Um, how do you approach a new area of focus? Like how do you actually get up to speed on one of these new areas? That's a good thing. I, I, I've, I've said this before in certain writings on LinkedIn and whatnot, but I think a graduate school teaches you a lot of this. Like, so how, how, you know, when I started my chemistry PhD, I knew nothing about, you know, olefin polymerization catalysis. And then by the end of my PhD, you know, I, I, th I think any any you know, PhD candidate is basically the world's expert in their teeny tiny area, <laughs> so so you really have to to to, to build that uh, build that skill in order to be to be successful. But um, I think the formula that I use, if I were to TLDR it, um, is to, to 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 read and talk to people basically. So um, in in industry like this. You know, applies to the chemical industry. This applies to tech. You know, when I when I join a new team or start a new program, I figure out who the most important experts and stakeholders are, and then I set up intro meetings. You know, I'm really trying to get a sense of the key things, like what are the types of things I need to know, what are the canonical resources, who else should I talk to. I don't like to leave any meeting without getting an onward referral to someone else who might be helpful to talk to, and you just get your prioritized list of people to talk to, and um. 
you know, I would say in general, like I'm a program manager. So um, that makes me a bit of a control freak by nature. And uh, I do like to go deep on subject matter. But, um, you know, for example, moving into SRE, that was really the first time that I realized it would not be possible to become the technical expert on the subject. Uh, but I realized then that I had something different to bring to the table. Um, and for me, it was all about enabling the program, enabling learning, even if I didn't understand at least to start, you know, what all the key, you know, the key, the, what the words were and the vocabulary and how it all fits together. And, and yeah, I started, started at zero. And today, you know, I know a lot more about SRE principles, best practices and culture. It's an amazing foundation, but I'm you know, certainly not the person you'd consult on the specifics of setting up your cloud deployment or you know, how you run your jobs and which specific storage solution that you choose, you know, those sorts of things. And you know, I've, I've made peace with that. And, you know, again, recognize that I'm bringing something different to the table. Yeah, I, I think it's really important. I, I initiative successful, especially training initiatives from what I've seen is is having a perspective that's a little bit outside the actual day-to-day -day work of what you're learning, right? It's quite difficult as someone who has 10 or 20 years, perhaps doing SRE experience, to translate everything you know into a way that someone new can understand. But as a newcomer, you might actually have a massive advantage there. Exactly. It can be easy to just get stuck in the weeds if you're you know, coming at it from that sort of expert expert position. Yeah. So. Um, do you have a, a set of like guiding principles that you've developed around teaching and learning, you know, new subjects? That's a good question. So, or, or teaching and learning, maybe like, I, I guess some of this is about how I apply it to programs and like spinning up a, 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 a training program. So I think the first thing is you know, don't hit people with the fire hose of information. So I think that ties into sometimes if you get the deep, deep experts teaching something like it, that, that, that's definitely a risk. Um, and you know, the next thing you know, people's heads are spinning and they're just over overwhelmed. Uh, tip, typically, you want to give people just enough to set them up for success in hands-on types of exercises. You know, adults learn by doing. And um, I think also it's important to focus on building confidence. So, it, in my view, confidence drives behavior. Behavior repeated over time is what drives culture. And um, and a lot of what we do with SRE, it's all about perpetuating that, uh, those cultural tenets and, and you know, the, the culture and ethos of, of uh, site reliability engineering. And um, the, the other thing I would say as well, and I think we're going to talk about this a little bit later as well, but I do pride myself on applying SRE principles to running training programs themselves. You know, do a progressive rollout. Don't simply launch the thing to 100% of your audience in a completely untested way. Like That's not a recipe for success. So um, progressive rollouts are key. I also think be, being data driven and knowing what your success criteria are before you start is important. So you'll know, you know, am I successful? Am I not? Should you know? Do we need to make tweaks here? Do we need to turn this thing down? Uh, rather than you know, hope relying on hope and continuing against the odds, so to speak. Um, I also think it's important. You need to understand the so what. Um, and and for me, it's not about did people like the training. We, you know, we, we appreciate when people give us a high net promoter score, but there's some there's some trainings where people just have to do it and you know, eat, eat their vegetables, even though they may not like it. And so, so you know, did they learn what you needed them to learn and, and, and sort of looking at it in that in that way? So those are just a few a few tidbits from over the years. Yeah, I, I want to dig in a little bit on the confidence piece and um, my perception of SRE, I've never worked as an SRE, but I have a little bit of like understanding of the field, is that there's a lot of, um, I'll call it like vulnerability built in on an individual level, right? Like you're constantly post-morteming what went wrong, what you could improve, like how do you kind of like move the discipline and the craft forward, which is something you have to not have a lot of ego to really like sit through. But I can also imagine that being difficult from like a, newcomer's confidence standpoint is like how do you get to a place where you're comfortable reflecting on on things that you could have done differently well, i think well it's that's a good that's a good one i, I hope number one i hope we're not constantly post-morteming because that means we're you know, our systems are probably not to the level of reliability that we that we need that we need them to be and sre really is all about you know trying to identify risks and mitigate 
risks before they become an issue, before it leads to to an outage. And you know, we'd rather that an outage is an exceptional case rather than a frequent a frequent occurrence. Um, but but that said, you know, you know, on call is part of the SRE role. Like that can be scary to some people. So that so I think um, one of the things we talk a lot about is you know, you're not alone, right? Like you have a team around you. You have people you can escalate to. It's okay to escalate. You you don't have to have all the answers. You, you know, so so I think it's those sorts of things like putting the support system around people like makes them more comfortable with these higher stress situations. Yeah, a hundred percent. Um, so why exactly, you know, is there such a focus on SRE training and continuing education, right? Like, like Google, you know, for all intents and purposes, invented SRE as a discipline, um, certainly coined the term, but like, why was there this need for the internal training and education part of it? And that is also a very good question, and and you're right. So so um, we we we're actually saying as well. Um, so this year, to, to 2023 is actually the the 20th anniversary of SRE as a discipline. So um, Ben Trainer, happy birthday! Well, thank you. In, in October of this year, uh, we'll celebrate the the 20th the 20th birthday, which is which is really exciting. But but I think um, the reason why training is important is that SRE is something that really isn't taught in school. Although that's something we would like to change. Um, and because of this, much of what folks need to know is learned on the job. And um, SREs really do need to, to, to know much more about a wide range of topics. It tends to be you, you go broad um, compared to a typical product developer. You know, might go deep into a more narrow area. So it is important to lay that broad foundation to set people up for success. And um, like like you alluded to earlier, there's certain foundational elements to an SRE culture. So, for example, blamelessness. And um, again, our SRE education program, um, our orientation in particular, is not about spraying people with that fire hose of information, but giving them just enough to build that confidence and to understand um, you know, the key elements of, of the culture. Yeah, adults learn by by doing, and and, and also the the, tra the training program as well. It gives an opportunity for storytelling, and storytelling is how the culture is is uh, is passed on, so to speak. Um, so I think those are those are some of some of the reasons. There's a, there's a lot to know. Uh, it's important to set people up for success from the start, give them that confidence so that they can be they can be successful. I, I don't know if you have a, a um, an answer ready for this, but I'm curious, like. Why do you think SRE type skills are not taught in schools? I, I was I was uh, talking to Titus Winters about this. Like he's um, he wrote the, the the Flamingo book, or is one of the, the co-editors of the Flamingo book on on software engineering. Um, yeah, that's not the title of the book, as you know, but uh, it's yeah. uh, Riley Animal on it. It's, and I, I think the the curriculum, you know, the undergraduate curriculum is just so jam packed um it's it's hard to squeeze in um yeah i don't i don't know so so, so yeah what you know if you, if you if you included something on your know, large scale distributed systems what drops to make room for it basically i think it's just a matter of of time and a strict prioritization so but we would like we would like to change that you know, at the very least you know, could you bring it in more as an elective uh some, something like that yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And, and you know, it's really interesting, like through some of the work that we do at MLH, like the places where we've seen at least like the systems skills come in are almost like more traditional IT degrees rather than computer science, which, you know, have their their own perception, right, in, in the world. But um, I, I really find it fascinating that like, you could probably go to a community college and learn a lot more about Linux systems than you know a, a four-year computer science program in many places. And you're probably you're probably right. And and is is there a way to marry the two or inject a little bit more sort of software engineering into those sorts of curriculums? Like it's 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 a it's a blended approach, is what I would say. Because yeah, at, yeah. At, at the end of the day, it's 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 about applying software engineering skills to operations problems. Mm -hmm. uh, basically enable enable scale basically yeah no i 
Yeah, that's really cool. I, I honestly think looking back, if if there was like an SRE type degree, I would have been super interested in that personally. Um, like I love tinkering with like servers and getting stuff up and running and like, you know, like like many kids had like a weird web hosting business at one point. But um, yeah, I think it's a really, really interesting to kind of like change how curriculum integrates that kind of thing. Um, Earlier, you mentioned that uh, you know the SRE training that you and your your team have developed uh, is almost like a little self referential, right? Like you incorporate SRE principles into actually designing and building the curriculum. What are some of those principles, and, and how do you actually work that into a training program? Sure, no, happy to, happy to talk about that. Like, that was some solid foreshadowing before on my on my part about what's to come, but. Um, I think for me, at one point, I just had this aha moment about how SRE principles can really apply well beyond you know large scale running large scale distributed systems. So, so for me, I like to I like to draw an analogy between the, you've got the software development like life cycle, and you're comparing that to building and running a training program. So, and so in both cases, like very simply, you need to think about the what and the how. So for software development, the what is your product features and the how is about deploying to production in a reliable way that meets the needs of your users. And for a training program, the what is the content. And oftentimes people, that's that's what people key in on, but they don't necessarily think about, you know, how many people is it gonna require to run this program? Like what are, what's, what are the operations around it? Um, so the how in the training program sense is, it's, it's all about deploying this consistent and reliable training program that meets the needs of our students. So um, in the SRE book, we published uh, the service reliability hierarchy, which is this pyramid that represents key SRE principles from the most foundational to the most advanced. And then you know, we've adapted that service reliability hierarchy to the training context. And, and this, is, this is what we've done here. So you know, at the base of the pyramid, you've got your monitoring. So in the, from a training perspective, we do monitoring in the form of attendance tracking, survey feedback, you know, next, you've got incident response. So we address issues that surface via our monitoring. You know, if our uh, sort of training sandbox goes down or didn't work the way we we anticipated, you know, like we we have to act on that quickly and 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 and, and mitigate the incident there. You know, we occasionally write postmortems when things go wrong so that we can learn from failure, which is another key SRE principle. Uh, keep going up the pyramid, you've got testing and release. So we, we do a lot of testing of our new content and programs, you know, running pilots at small scales before, before we do this progressive rollout to larger and larger audiences. And then all the while we're scaling our operations uh, by looking for opportunities to vanquish toil <laughs> through automation so we can make the most of our limited human resources. We, we don't want to feed the training program with uh, humans. We want to, we want to, we want to, uh, feed it with you know, judicious automation and make sure we can run as efficiently as possible so that we can you know, scale super linearly um, to the size of our team. And then um, it's, it's, you know, it's really only when we do these things that our, our program is fully actualized and we can realize the full potential of the curriculum design and the program itself. Um, yeah, and, and it's really this, the pinnacle of the service reliability. Reliability hierarchy is the product and the pinnacle of the training reliability hierarchy is, you know, the the program that you've sort of put together and tied up with a bow, looking at both the what and the how. That is so, like, novel in a lot of ways. Like, I part of me thinks that you could take that framework that you just described and abstract it away and be like, hey, like, you know professors at universities like start thinking about your courses in this way and that a lot of good might come of it and even I, I, you know I think I think it's worth thinking in these terms I think I think like I see SRE principles everywhere I turn now like when I mm. when I travel I apply SRE principles when you know it's, I, I, I apply it like life hack with SRE principles is it a talk that I enjoy giving about um, SRE anti patterns in everyday life and what they teach us. So it's kind of kind of cool. Like once we, once you learn about SRE, you see it everywhere, basically. Yeah. Well, what's an example of how that comes into effect with travel? Like I love traveling too, but I'm curious. Like how could I apply SRE to my travels? 
Well, it's, I, I always say like, and this 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 always sounds like a, a, like I, I I call it it's 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 SREing a travel emergency. So I remember my husband and I were traveling in Croatia a few years ago, and we rented bicycles. And at one point, he hit a little pothole, and next thing you know, he's yep. flying through the air, landing landing on you know, landing on his side of his face a little bit, and yeah, you know, we ended up having to go like get stitches and whatnot. So. Um, I, I think after that, yeah, you know, we we handled the incident, so to speak, um, and then I, I did a bit of a, a retrospective. Let's call it a retrospective, not a post mortem. When we when we got yeah. home, um, and you know, yeah, you know, what went well, what could have been improved, where did we get lucky? Yeah, you know, we were we were lucky. We weren't renting a car on that trip, um, but we had our driver's license with driver's licenses with us. So when we had to you know take him to a different place to kind of get the stitches looked at, we were able to rent a car. You know things, things like that. So, just uh, that's one simple, not so happy example. But like he, yeah, and he's fine. Just to be, just to be clear. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's really a, a cool way of looking at the world. Um, yeah. I feel like a lot of people probably do bits and pieces of that uh, unknowingly. Exactly. Got to dirt test your life, as they say. You know, disaster recovery testing, basically. Yep. Yeah, I, I had a. Uh, I've had like these shelves in 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 my room over the, not this room, but and they kept falling down whenever someone knocked into them. And I like kept going through this cycle, and eventually I was like, I need to like secure this. Like I need to make sure this never can happen again, and you know improve the system. But I don't know. Maybe that's a flimsy example, but I I like. It. <laughs> no, hey, it's important, and like it's it's if you're, if you're driving improvements in a systematic way, it doesn't doesn't matter what the domain is. So that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, awesome. Um. So uh, a couple of like general questions I love to, to end on when I'm talking to folks. Um, you know, when you look at the wider industry, what are some like tech education resources or creators that you, you think are doing a really good job right now? Okay. Yeah, great question. And uh, I had to give this some thought because sometimes it's just you, you um, it don't take time to really reflect on this. So I appreciated the opportunity to think about it. So, so number one, I'll say MLH. Uh, I really do admire the work that you guys do, that that you folks Thank do, you. Um, it, you know, to really help people upskill and perhaps you know, consider a broader range of career options. And I know we've really appreciated the, the opportunity to partner with you on the SRE Fellowship Program. Uh, I think other other resources that I that I think are super valuable. So the like MOOCs that democratize learning. So if you look at MIT Open Courseware, Courseware, I think that's pretty amazing that you can have access to all that that great uh, courseware, you know, as if you're getting a degree at MIT. <laughs> um, I think uh, Coder Jojo um, and, and in Ireland, I, you know, I lived in Ireland for 12 years. There's programs like the Munster program programming training. It's a program in Cork that exposes younger kids to coding. So things like that that get people started early and get people hooked on on, on tech and computer science early, I think are, are key. And beyond that, anything practical, anything that's learning by doing. So community hackathons, open source projects, things like that. So really, your know, opportunities to apply what you learn in theory, I think that's the most important aspect of making it stick. So those are just you know, some some examples of that. Yeah, fantastic list. I, I was briefly involved with the Coder Dojo chapter in New York and yeah. like loved the experience. It was such a cool like opportunity to work with like young people who are interested in you know tech stuff. Yeah. I always remember with the the MPT program in Cork the. the, the um, so University College Cork would host an annual um, hackathon. So I, IRL CPC, it was called. And so you'd have the college students competing, and then they would actually have some of the MPT folks participating. And the the the, the primary and secondary school students like sometimes did better than the college students, <laughs> which was amazing. So yeah, there's really um, a lot of benefits to these to these types of programs. Yeah, definitely. Um, so when you think about uh, you know taking some of the lessons you've learned in in SRE training and and all of your work over the years, is there anything that you would like to see change about how developers learn in general? I think that's a that's a that's a really good question. Um, we we talked already a little bit about how SRE and sort of things like that are not really taught in school, but I do think a grounding in the practical aspects of building software that scales. Would be a great thing to add to the to the mix of education. Um, 
you know, again, as I understand it, traditional program education programs are focused on the what, so um, the products and, and its features, and less on the how. Like, how does it work? How easy is it supported? Will it work well, as well with a thousand, a hundred thousand, a million, a billion users as it does with five users? You know, with your other students in your group or whatever. So I think I think um, adding some of those practical the, the practical aspects of building software that scales. Um, yeah, really focusing on the practicalities of running services in production. Because today, yeah, you've got industry internships, you've got placements, but you don't really get that in the classroom per se. So I do I do recommend to, to the, the university students that I talk to in particular, you know, new developers, like try, you know, try and get as much hands-on experience as you can, like put into practice the things that you're that you're learning, uh, even if it's not sort of formalized in your your curriculum. Yeah. And I think what you mentioned earlier about getting involved with open source, going to hackathons, like those are really fantastic vehicles for applying a lot of what you're learning. Um, it's funny, like I talked to a lot of people uh, who got their starts by tinkering, you mm -hmm. know, and there's almost like a necessity to figure out how everything works when you're tinkering with a piece of technology. And the easier it gets, the less that necessity is there, yeah. but there's still a lot of cool stuff going on beneath the surface. Makes sense, and I hope I have a phone ringing somewhere. I hope you can can you hear it? Hopefully, you can't hear it through Google Meet. I don't hear it. I think it's filtering it out. Good. Okay, just just checking before we move on to the next question. Sorry about that. I think it didn't. I, in case we had to do another take on that question, but that's no, all good. Uh, well, good, good noise filtering. Huh. Um, yes. So, oh, and, and I was just going to put in a plug for um, Google Summer of Code. Oh, yeah. so I think that's, that's a great opportunity, like you were saying, to, to, to get involved in open source. And uh, you can basically apply to work on an open source project over the summer. You'll get paid a stipend. And uh, I think applications will still be open by the time uh, this podcast airs. So uh, GSOC, check it out. Let me double check. I, I think it will, too. But um... Yeah, I thought so. Oh, yeah, really it'll, it'll definitely be open. It's March 20th to April 4th. Exactly. So, yeah, just um, I think that's a great opportunity for hopefully some of the folks listening. Yeah, no, I, GSOC is a fantastic program. I've definitely uh, been, been inspired by it myself um, in a lot of the work that we do at MLH. Um, awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I really appreciated everything you shared. Um, the question I love to end on with folks, uh, which it's kind of just like a personal reflective question. Um, is there anyone in the world of like science or tech that, that you would just love to take to lunch for a couple hours, like pick their brain, spend some time with them? That is a really good question. And uh, thank you for uh, giving me a heads up. You might be asking this. Um, so because <laughs> my, my, my first thought, actually, when you floated this question was, you know, alive now or of all time? <laughs> I, I've um, heard alive and not alive as answers. No, th thank you. And I, I was going to say, for purposes of this question, I'm going to assume that I have access to a time machine. And um, I'm actually going to use my time machine to pick up some folks and host a dinner party. You know, maybe this is Bill and Ted's excellent adventure style. <laughs> I don't know. But um, some people I would definitely invite to my uh, time machine dinner party, um, Marie Curie, you know, with the you know, tying into the chemistry background there. I, I'd just be fascinated to learn, you know, what it was like to work with such, such conviction, discover and isolate new elements, to win two no Nobel Prizes. Like, that is badass. Like, that's that's really cool. Um, Rosalind Franklin, uh, you know, what was it like to make such momentous contributions to, to the uh, discovery of the fabric of the human genome, you know, understanding that molecular structure of DNA and RNA, and then, unfortunately, to not immediately get credit for that work. So that's, you know, just I'm glad she's getting more recognition now, but that's that's one. Um, veering off a little bit, Henry the Navigator. Like, I live in Portugal, and Henry the Navigator is is everywhere. Um, he's credited as the, the, the key spark that launched that age of exploration and sent, you know, sent explorers uh, around the world. Uh, so that, that kind of ties into my wanderlust and, and, and interest in travel. Um, Einstein seems like a no-brainer, like that's an interesting character. Um, Diane Fossey, I'm fascinated by her work um, to understand gorillas in the wild in Uganda, in Rwanda. 
And uh, I think about Margaret Hamilton from the Apollo space program, like her attention to detail essentially saved people's lives. And it, you know, in the Essary book, you know, we, we um, hypothesize, you know, we kind of give her credit, like maybe she was perhaps the very first SRE. Um, Neil deGrasse Tyson, so I think he explains astronomy in terms that are easily understood, and I think he might be a good bridge to some of the other guests at my uh, Time Machine dinner party. A uh, couple more, don't worry, I'm, re I'm coming to an end here. Uh, oh, this is great. <laughs> I, I was thinking like um, Darwin and Galileo, right? Like both of them drove change to the prevailing paradigms at the time. Uh, despite tremendous pressure to not rock the boat and tremendous risk to themselves for rocking the boat. And then uh, we, we talked at the very beginning, like I did my undergraduate work at the University of Rochester and uh, George Eastman of Eastman Kodak and you know, film photography fame, as well as Chester Carlson, who invented serography. You know, both of them have ties to Rochester, New York, uh, where I went to school. Um, so we'd love to throw a couple practical inventors into the mix there. And then finally, um, I would add uh, Carolyn Bertozzi to the mix. So she is alive and well. She's a professor at Stanford and uh, just won the Nobel Prize in chemistry this year, which is amazing. And I do remember meeting her when uh, she was just starting out an assist as an assistant professor at UC Berkeley. And you can tell even back then, you know, she was headed for greatness. And, um, you know, she just won the Nobel Prize for coining the term, you know, bioorthogonal chemistry. Uh, basically discovering chemical reactions that are compatible with living systems and, and develop this whole whole field. So she was really like mixing ideas from dis different disciplines even before it was the norm. So, you know, I think that's that's my that's my list of dinner party invitation invitees. Um, what do you think, John? Would that be would that be I mean, that sounds like the most incredible dinner party ever? And I can only imagine it would be a wild and bizarre experience. <laughs> Oh, and you're invited too. How about that? Oh, I mean, I would love to meet every single one of those people. <laughs> and honestly, I hope that you or one of them will get the Nobel Prize for inventing that time machine. Oh, that a uh, fair, fair play. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much, Jennifer. I really enjoyed everything you had to share. And and uh, honestly, like the the work that you're doing is super cool. And and frankly, like I I think a lot of people probably have a lot to learn from how you approach education and how you approach building those kinds of programs. So um, thank you again. And I hope everyone enjoyed listening. Uh, where where can they find um, some of your work or, or some of the SRE work that you've published out there if people want to track it down? Uh, that is a good one. Um, so you could check SRE.Google. So that's where we host a lot of the, the Google specific uh, writing on SRE, um, in the SRE books, the full test text of the SRE books are posted there, um, as well as a report that I uh, myself and some others wrote on uh, training SREs. Mm. If you search for SRECon, um, that's, there's a, a few SRECon talks out there as well. And then I do, I do, um, publish periodically periodically to, to LinkedIn. So, you know, find, find me on LinkedIn. Uh, if you're interested in, in travel, find me on sidewalksafari.com, um, you know, including my SREing a travel emergency article. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty easy to find, I have to say. <laughs> awesome. Well, um, thank you again. And uh, if folks enjoyed it, definitely check out more episodes and, you know, like and subscribe and all the fun things you can do to follow along. Um, and uh, happy hacking, everyone. Thanks. Thanks very much. The State of Developer Education is brought to you by Major League Hacking, or MLH. To find out more about MLH and how we power innovation, cultivate developer communities, and teach technical skills to students around the world, visit mlh.io. And then make sure to search for Developer Education in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or anywhere else podcasts are found. Make sure to click subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Don't forget to like and review the show, and we'll give you a shout out on a future episode. On behalf of the team here at MLH, thanks for listening and helping us empower the next generation of technologists. Happy hacking.